required, such as the case of the town, uh, the turf field, should it be approved, it will be, um, we'll need to file an application with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, we don't bond funds unless we require them. So, for instance, if the bid on the fire truck comes in under 950000 and 925, we only borrow 925000 um, And sometimes we smooth out our borrowing. We have reserves um, so that you know, we can split the borrowing over two years if need be. So I move to appropriate 127000 for the construction, for the, excuse me, for the construction and reconstruction of Scribner Hill Road and authorizing the issuance of up to 125,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. So this is um, a one, uh, a estimated to be a million point eight twenty seven project. Um, we're asking this year for the 127,000 to design the project and expect to ask for approximately 1.7 million next year at the town meeting. So many of you may be aware there was damage to the road um, several months ago. The northbound lane of the road has been closed almost a year. Uh, a geotechnical engineer was engaged to evaluate the damaged section. Uh, the next phase is the design of the work that needs to be done to repair the road and make it fully usable. We did apply for a straight grant for this. We've been very successful, as you'll hear later, with grants, but unfortunately, because this is not a commuting road, it's not a well-traveled road, um, the state uh, declined our grant. We do questions at the end, right? Thank you. Okay, so next. I move appropriating up to one million 935 for the planning, design, acquisition, and construction of the turf field at Allen's Meadow and authorizing the issuance of 1,935,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation. So I think you're all familiar with what a turf field is. Uh, this turf, oh, second, anybody? Thank you very much, Warren. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, he used to stand on the stage many years ago. Um, I think you're all familiar with what a, a turf field is. This turf field would be the size of the lily, which is larger than the stadium turf field. It would have LED efficient lighting. Um, these are not the lights that you see right now on lily in the stadium. They are much more modern, more down lighting. Um, so they won't be dispersing into other areas. Uh, the only other lighting would be path lighting from the field to the uh, parking lot, the field will abut the parking lot that's closest to Route 7, if you're familiar with Allen's Meadow. Um, there will be some work done on the parking lot as part of the project. Uh, we're seeking to have minimal disruption to Allen's Meadow, no as asphalt, no additional fencing. Um, I'm not gonna link it. If somebody wants to look at it, I'll do it. It's basically a turf field. Um, the bonding does not include uh, possible uh, infrastructure for a possible seasonal uh, bubble um, that could be installed in the future. It's allowed under the state lease. Uh, any work that has to be done with the installation of the field for a possible bubble will be paid for by the board. Uh, Newark will fully fund uh, the, their obligation, which we'll look at that when we look at the cost. Um, by the time of contract execution. We're not going to execute a contract um, without those funds paid. Uh, the town does have a, a sinking fund for the replacement of turf fields. Uh, we started that back in uh, 2016 uh, at the time that we replaced the field at the stadium. Um, so we take all the revenues from uh, field rentals and light rentals and that goes into the sinking fund. We also have a, a banner program at the stadium and Lily, which has been managed by WAR um, on behalf of the town, and those funds are transferred to the town to be held in the sinking fund. Um, our share of any field and light revenue at Allen's would also be deposited into the sinking fund. 
So here's the cost. Currently, the cost of the turf field it would be higher if someone, an engineering firm, to develop these estimates and do a conceptual design. The uh, current uh, estimated cost is $1,822,000. Um, the turf, if approved, wouldn't be installed until next spring, so the estimating cost escalation is about $109,000, and we have a 10% contingency in there of 182,000. So that's 2.1 million, 180,000 of which uh, will be funded by WARF. They've agreed to fundraise. That's first dollar. So we need that 180,000 from WARF before we proceed. And the maximum bond would be 1 million 934, um, assuming the contingency and the cost escalation is shown. The possible seasonal uh, Bubble infrastructure, that's estimated to cost 320,000. That's, a, as I said, 100% uh, of WARF's cost. Again, that money would have to be uh, handed over by WARF prior to the construction. If it comes in at 400,000, that risk is WARF's. They would have to contribute the 400,000. Um, if the contingency is not required at all, then the cost is 1,752. First dollars are again the 180,000 uh, from WARF, and the balance will be bonded. I just want to point out when I stand here as the chief executive officer of the town and say that at the town meeting, it means something. So there's been a lot of questions about, you know, what if we don't get as much money? What if this, this is what happens when I stand here and make the statement as first select woman at a town meeting and people make a decision based on it? It, it sticks. So um, I just want to make that very clear to everyone. Um, if I said it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. Um, so that is deals with the cost. Uh, so why a third turf field? Um, a, first of all, there's advantages to turf fields. They provide for a greater number of hours of playing time if you went by the fields today, on your way here, you notice the only place people were playing, at least when I came, was on the turf fields. If you were out driving around, um, I think it was Saturday when it was raining and I was driving around, the only, turf, uh, the only place where anything was being played was on the turf fields. All the grass fields were empty. Um, you can take a, 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 a um, link. This is all on the top town's website. You can hit these links at your leisure but you can't play on a grass field when it's in wet conditions. Our, our town fields are overplayed. When you leave here, go take a ride by uh, Guy Witten, which is right in front of, um, over here, in front of the stadium. Um, you can see that is a field that is overplayed. It's, it has a lot of dirt on it. It is not the fault of the parks and grounds folks. They worked on it. The field rested in the winter, but that's not long enough for a field to rest. You really need to take a field out of play for much longer than that. So, um, and if you were going to maintain the turf field to the, uh, the grass field rather, to the quality of a turf field, which we do not do, you would be spending just over $100,000 a year, and the bulk of that cost is sod replacement. So, and you would also have to install irrigation systems in order to have uh, a grass field of the same quality of a turf field. So why do we need it? We do have a shortfall in available playing times. The, uh, we have two turf fields right now, and there is more demand for, than the time that is available. Um, and again, if you take a look at this on the town website. If you look at that time period, which is what the board selectmen uh, and I did, um, you could see from April 17th to May 14th, as of April 19th, there really wasn't much left during the week other than 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night, and then, you know, kind of the later hours on Sunday. Uh, some of the weekend days were booked all 14, 14 hours out of the day, starting uh, from the first available time. Um, the other, uh, one of the big features about Allen's is it's not on town. Uh, school managed property. It's town owned, but not school managed. Um, Lily and the high school stadium are on school property, which means the school's uh, teams have first priority. 
The use of the fields by the school teams has increased this fall. They use the, uh, the turf fields 25% uh, more than they had in the past. Um, and the Wilton High School teams can bump, and they do bump other organizations. So you might be signed up, um, if you're a youth group, you may be signed up for a particular time, and you know, congratulations to a Wilton High School team that makes it in to some playoffs, and now they're bumping because they need that extra time for the playoffs. So there is a demonstrated need for the third field. By pulling, putting it at Allen's, we can change the priority, let the schools have the priority of the two existing fields. Allen's will be prioritized for uh, non-high school youth sports and for adults. We have a high level of youth sport participation. It's very different than it was when my son, who's now 31, was playing sports. Uh, sports are year round. People play multiple sports, uh, so uh, you can see the numbers right there with the high number of um, young people, not under high school age, that are participating in sports in Wilton. So there were environmental considerations. Um, we are, um, as I think most of you know, back in 2016, we were the first in the state to use a coconut husk infill instead of the crumb rubber infill. Other towns have followed our lead, but uh, we truly were the first. Um, so turf fields do not need watering. As of June 23rd, Wilton it will now be subject to Aquarian's water restrictions. We hadn't been prior to that. So even though we have fields at Allen's that have irrigation, we're going to have voluntary uh, restrictions in 2023, and then they'll be mandatory in 2024. So we'll most likely not be able to water as much as we have in the past. You all remember the drought that happened this past summer. Um, coconut husk and filters do not create heat. That is crumb rubber uh, and fill. If you've ever played or you've ever been on the fields, um, then you know how hot that black crumb rubber can get. But if you take, if you haven't, stand on the track on a hot day, which is the black rubber, and then go stand on the turf field with the coconut husk, you can feel um, the difference. Uh, so the question has come up about PFAS chemicals. And they're forever chemicals. They, they, they've been around for a long time. Um, they, for many, many, you know, I don't, it goes way back that they were used in firefighter foam. Um, they become a topic of a greater interest uh, really in 2019, and the question has come about, are they in turf fields? Uh, one of the reasons that you don't want crumb rubber, quite honestly, is PFAS. It wasn't the reason everyone had started to question it, but uh, PFAS is an issue with crumb rubber. So we had our fields tested. I appreciate the fact that the Noahawk River uh, Watershed Association brought up this issue. They did some testing with, along with another group, or another group did it for them, but they did not test the water coming directly off of Lily and the stadium. Only the town did that. We um, tested, we hired a professional firm who is experienced and licensed in performing PFAS uh, testing. You have to have that specialty because you probably all have PFAS on you right now. And so contamination um, is a big issue when doing that testing. You know, it's in your shampoo, it's in your cosmetics, your moisturizer, your nail polish, your sneakers, your clothing. So um, this has to be done properly. So we used that firm, they did the samples, they came back that it was non-detectable in um, the water sampled from our two turf fields. Now they can only detect down to two nanograms per liter. Uh, the standard, and, and what they did is they tested the things that the EPA is recommending be um, considered for drinking water, that if they're above a certain standard, then you have to treat that drinking water because you can remove the PFAS from the drinking water. So for example, the two that are the biggest issues, in order to treat for drinking water, 
it's above four nanograms or at four. So ours came in detect not detectable at two, so that's half of what the standard is for drinking water. And nobody's drinking the water off of the turf field, but that's, you know, we're measuring against what is the strictest standards. Anyway, probably more yet than you ever wanted to know. I will also point out that we tested the go-to brook that runs alongside of the north side of Lily and then the north side of Northfield. We tested it just south of Northfield, so that water had run past Lily and that also came back non-detectable, non-detected. Our, the manufacturer of the two turf fields that we have, which would be the same that we would use for the third field, they've represented to us, and you can again go on the website and read, that their turf fields do not contain PFAS chemicals. The state has addressed twice the question of a turf field at Allen's, once when we asked it, and they agreed to a lease with it, and then uh, a resident contacted them and ask that they uh, reconsider it, and which they did. Also, if you go on the um, state website, the Connecticut Department of Health, they point out that there is only one peer-reviewed study, it was out of Sweden, and it found that fluorinated substances in turf fields do not leach into the environment. They're not the type of fluorinated chemicals that transform into the harmful PFAS. So that's what the state and the Department of Public Health has to say on it. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about crumb rubber granules, the little round pellets, and um, turf fields. Because you'll often, maybe you're gonna read an article that even the articles it use them interchangeably, which they really shouldn't. So, um, the EU is considering a ban on synthetic infill, i.e. the crumb rubber or plastic. Sometimes people coat it with a plastic coating to change the color. Uh, but they are not considering a ban on the turf fields. So they actually got the recommendation to do it in, in late April, and in about a month they'll make the decision. But again, that's on the crumb rubber. And again, there's, a, there's been a lot of talk about a, a study in Sweden that study was of crumb rubber granules, not of turf fields. And I'll tell you, if you, if you Google uh, Connecticut ban turf fields, you'll get an article, you'll get lots of articles that say Westport banned turf fields. And you click on the link in the article, and it's about Westport banning crumb rubber. So it's, it's a little frustrating that the journalists can't get this right. So, we have a uh, proposed lease with the state of Connecticut. Our current lease expires at the end of November. Um, uh, it's a 30-year cumulative term, twice what we have now. So it would be 10 years initial term with two 10-year extensions at the town's option. There is no rent as long as we do not charge a fee. So in the case of charging a fee, which we had done in the past for the community gardens, or if we charge a fee for the turf rental, then a portion of that fee would go to the state and would be negotiated when we get to that point. Um, the new uses under the um, lease are community gardening, which has been going on for a long time, apparently without the state's permission. A turf field, a seasonal bubble over the, in the possible seasonal seasonal bubble over the turf field and the required infrastructure for such. We're not allowed to use pesticides. And as I said, we have, it expires at the end of November and we would re execute a new lease prior to that time. So next, I move a resolution appropriating 950,000 acquisition of a replacement fire engine and authorizing the issuance of 950,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. So we replace fire trucks on a 20-year cycle. It takes three years from the time that it's approved at a town meeting when you go through the design phase because every fire truck is custom built unless you were lucky enough like we were a few years ago to um, by a demo truck. Unfortunately, there aren't any available right now. Um, so at the point that the truck would be 
a new truck would be delivered, the current truck that it's replacing would be more than 20 years old. One of the major issues with fire trucks that we've been experiencing is the undercarriage, the impact of the, um, the uh, salt that's put down on the road. So we are changing, and we did it with the last one that you all authorized last year or the year before, a different material on, on, on the undercarriage, and we hope to get more than 20 uh, years life. Next, I move resolution appropriating 780,000 for the construction and installation of school district roof replacements and authorizing the issuance of 780,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation. So you've seen roof appropriations over the last few What a second? Oh my God. Thank God this is my last year doing this. You think, you think it might age out? Maybe I get it right. I think this is the only one where I would remember to second it. What can I say? Um, you know, you don't want somebody's on the way out the door. All right, did someone second that? Thank you very much. Okay, so where was I? Uh, see a few of these school roofs where we have, uh, we've had them all uh, thermal uh, scanned. We have the imaging, engineering evaluation. Roofs are like roads. If you don't take care of them, you end up with a lot bigger problem. So, um, the section that we're talking about now is, is at Middlebrook. It is, um, section is 28 years old, and the work that we'll be doing on it, it's not, we're not completely replacing it, we're restoring it, and that will give us a 20 year uh, warranty. It's less expensive to do it that way. Okay, next, 275,000 for the design and installation of a new elevator at the Cider Mill School. And I forgot to say, I move a resolution appropriating 275,000 for the acquisition, planning, design, and installation of the school district elevator replacements and authorizing the issuance of 275,000 bonds of the town to meet said appropriation. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. So again, this is the fourth elevator replacement. This elevator is at its, the end of its useful life and the, the code has changed for school elevators. In case you're curious about the uh, dosi -si doing that we're doing, there's a giant pit that's right here, and there's about a three foot gap that we can walk through. So we're being very careful not to uh, end up in the pit of despair. <laughs> it's now time for the uh, comment period on the bonding resolutions. So anybody that wishes to speak on any of the bonding resolutions, not the budget, that'll come later, now is the time to do so to come up to the microphones on either side. A reminder that each person can speak for three minutes on any one resolution. If you want to speak on more than one resolution, it's a total of six minutes, but only three minutes on any one resolution. Uh, per the town charter, the bonding resolutions cannot be amended at the town meeting, so there will be no motions that can be made to reduce or modify the amount of the bonding that is being requested. The only vote will occur after the adjournment of the town meeting and the vote that occurs at that point. And a reminder again to clearly state your name and street address when you come up to speak. So if anybody wishes to, now is the time to speak on any of the bonding resolutions. On the right, over here. On the right. Scott Lawrence, 79 Hamilton Road. I want to start this entire process by saying thank you. I'm grateful for the service and work each and every one of you has done for sitting on that stage. I particularly respect and understand and grateful for the moderator service, having been in those shoes a couple times myself. I'm up here to speak unequivocally in support of the term. Just seen a presentation by the first select woman for all of the reasons going back years why the curve is being. I understand there are concerns raised about environmental. 
environmental issues, those have been studied and addressed. There have been concerns raised about fundraising for war. I hope those have been addressed. But to the extent they're not, let me give you a little bit of a human face for war. You're looking at it. We are war. War is you. We are parents, coaches, volunteers. We are the people who volunteer to serve the town. We volunteer in service of your students. We volunteer in service of everybody. We are committed to raising $500,000 towards this project. We are excited to do so. We are proud to do so. To the extent there's any doubt about our intentions, those are our intentions. And to the extent we do not succeed in meeting that goal, well, then nothing gets built. So we are committed to seeing this through. And I think that needs to be said next. We welcome your support. We are grateful for the town's leadership in pushing this forward and doing very rigorous diligence. And we look forward to what happens next at the vote. We encourage each of you to do your own diligence, study what is being presented, understand them, see the benefits, get excited about this, because it will be a wonderful project for the town. With that, I end as I start with gratitude and say thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Corey, it's on 20 Pilgrim Trail. Uh, I'm here to provide my unequivocal support as well for the turf fields. I am a, uh, I have a senior daughter and a great son who are both athletes, multi-sport athletes, and near and dear to our heart is the sport of lacrosse. And with that, in the past about a decade, I've been a volunteer with the Golden Cross Association in different roles of coaching, scheduling, being a parent on the sidelines, just love the sport and have a lot of players that I love coaching and being a part of. Um, with that, some recent uh, news based on, you know, Lynn mentioned it, but um, just this last eight days, Mother Nature is, is obviously a force of nature, right? We've had tremendous rain and storms. What that does is really affects the opportunities that our kids have to practice and play games. And part of that, when we have grass field use, um, we don't start the, uh, the season until April 1, based on when the grass is available to play, based on the winter. Um, so that puts us about a month behind other towns with ample turf fields to be able to start practicing, especially for the younger grades where it's so important to get out there. Um, with that, practice happens uh, April 1, spring break occurs, so there's no activity there, but then we get into late April where games start to occur. In this past week, we've lost the opportunity for six uh, games uh, to be played with our youth which is about 100 different kids uh, at this level. And they're really hoping to get out on the fields and play, and that was canceled early on on Saturday. So just to really put in context what this actually means to actual kids in, in the program. Uh, lastly, um, we had uh, an opportunity to practice this past winter in the Danbury Dome. And that was uh, scheduled on a Wednesday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Very inconvenient for parents to get their children there. Uh, with that, we had very low enrollment for this winter in their sessions. Uh, as a just small example, in eighth grade, we have 25 kids that are really dedicated to the sport. We instead held the activities outside on the turf at 8 o'clock at night in 30 degree weather, and we had 100% participation by our kids. They're ready to play, they want to play, and this new turf gives us another opportunity to get them out there. Uh, so thank you. Michael Wall, two minutes. I grew up heavily involved in uh, sports and I continued throughout my high school career playing lacrosse, football, and basketball. I stand before you today to express my strong support for the construction of the new upgraded turf field on Allen Meadows. As a member of this community, I believe that this new field will have a profoundly positive impact on the youth in our town, as well as the entire community as a whole. Currently, the field lacks quality fields, which is adversely affecting the accessibility and opportunities for our construction of this new updated turf field at Allen Meadows will not only enhance access, quality, and safety of play for its youth, but it will also improve the quality of life for families who are often forced to travel to neighboring towns to use turf fields to fill in these gaps. Furthermore, the new turf field will reduce town costs for maintenance and drive positive economic growth for our town, with efficient LED lights for safe, even play, and ideal locations within walking distance from the school. The new turf field will undoubtedly benefit Lastly, the proposed new turf field will be the same surface materials used for Fujikami and Olympians. The 
supplier has two, two fields and pro supplier for this product is certified that the product does not use the fast chemicals. So concerns about contamination from such chemicals are unjustified. By approving this project, our athletic facilities will better meet the standards and the needs of ever growing youth sport involvement and increase the value of these offerings to existing and potential new residents. I urge all eligible 18 plus residents to vote yes on May 6th Come together as a community to invest in our youth's future and create a better Wilson for everyone. Thank you. I'm in opposition to the turf field. Please do not. I'm not in opposition to something else. Uh, an alternative such as a dog park, which would not require the use of pesticides. However, I'm against a uh, plastic carpet. I just clarify something so um, Red made the comment that you couldn't uh, put a bubble over turf field because you can't puncture it but the 320,000 that Morph would be paying towards the infrastructure would be the infrastructure for the, the uh, beam that goes around which is what you connect the uh, bubble to it's, it's an I-beam it's concrete and it's buried and that's why you have to install at the same time you install the field so it's around the outer area. Just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. Yes. Hi, my name is Isabel Bonanno, 170 Slunk Lane. Um, as is my blood, I'm also a three sport athlete and I'm a senior at the high school. But I won't talk everyone's ear off about um, any numbers or anything. All I'm here to say is I think the biggest thing about being an athlete is something that's become really apparent in my life is that over COVID especially, like we had to learn to become a human before we can become an athlete. And the biggest thing about that is the time that it is to be an athlete in this town is like no other. I mean, I go after school to three hours of lacrosse to go home to do homework. And being a three sport athlete all year round comes the off season and you also need to prepare for your other sports. Um, as um, Mr. Corey did say, we went to the Danbury during this whole entire winter for an hour um, practice, and just driving there alone is a hassle to go with. Um, but I just wanted to say it's one of those things where, although I'm that I'm leaving, it's for the respect of the athletes too. We put a lot of time and a lot of effort um, into every into every day and every practice. And I think that implementing this term at Athens will not only um, benefit the athletes, but will always encourage more kids to get out there. Sports are a great way to make friends, especially for new kids coming into the town. And being um, an athlete here is something that I'm proud to be. So the new term will just add a different level. And I hope that you all vote for this term. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tom Dexter, uh, 36 Pelham Lane. Uh, we've lived in town for 20 years and raised all four of our kids here. Uh, all four of them have gone to the district. Uh, Lynn, thank you for your, um, your thoughtful and fact-based analysis. Um, I can sit here and talk about sports. Um, I'm a coach here. Uh, I 
come from the schools, uh, but I want to talk about the schools. Um, it, we are in an arms race with the towns around here to attract young families to come here. I'm having a hard time understanding why we would adopt or, or fund something that brings families here, that ultimately increases real estate values, which then makes its way into the school district. Not only is this an elite school district from an academic standpoint, it's an elite school district from a special services standpoint. Uh, I also have uh, two nieces and a nephew here in the school system who enjoy the benefits of all you have to offer. So I'm here to represent uh, the tax revenues that are important to keeping funded our elite school district. Thank you. who's in the second grade, and I am here to support the turf field. I think First Select Woman, Andrew Slavis, did an excellent job of putting forward the merits of the proposition. I just want to put a face to it by bringing my kids here. Um, you know, there's so many things that are important about these schools. It's, it's exercise, sure, um, but it's also social. It's also confidence. You know, having anxiety, it's, it's tough. And so being able to participate in these team sports really tries to help to address that. And also speaking as a mom who's a husband with two young children, this was the sport in terms of soccer that allowed them to get outside and participate. And I think that's sort of overlooked and forgotten now that we're sort of through it. But this was one of the things that actually brought us to that. And so I think these two fields, given the points we put forward before in terms of the overuse, the, the same number of fields for the last 30 years, the number of sports that have grown, the number of children that have grown here, all demonstrate that the highest and best use from a real estate perspective is the turf field. So I ask for everyone's support in responding to this year. My name is Tony Boucher. I live at Five Woods and Lane here in Milton. Um, I am going to address one of the bond items, but first a comment about Lynn Vanderslice, who has regrettably decided to retire from office after this term. Wiltonians on all sides of the political aisles have remarked to me that they have found Lynn to be an extremely capable first elector who has served the town so well. I would go further to say that she has served it with integrity, intellect, and dedication. We've seen some of that tonight. I'm grateful for her sound leadership. It's not an easy position to hold for so many years, as many contentious and controversial issues always appear, and each day you present a new challenge. Let's not forget COVID. Lynn has met these challenges and overcame them, leaving many completed projects for the town for residents to enjoy. An enduring legacy and hallmark of the town soundness is his bond rating, which Lynn has been a hawk. Moody's again has assigned a AAA rating to the town of Wilton. They say that the rating reflects Wilton's stable local economy supported by exceptionally strong residential market and high resident incomes. However, it goes on to say the rating additionally reflects the town's low leverage and fixed cost stable financial operations and moderate reserves of liquidity. We anticipate that these characteristics will remain key credit strengths for the town. Thank you, Lynn. My second comment is in regards. Yes, this is a comment. Now, my second comment is in regards to what appeared to me to be a non-controversial issue: turf fields. I understand from members of our town's boards that they have rarely seen a proposal with so many positive letters and emails of support, including the state DOT, and you can see it by the number of people standing up here tonight. The one concern expressed by some is contamination. So the town studied this possibility thoroughly to validate concerns on that front. It had also pledged not to use crumb rubber fill. Our neighboring towns have all expanded their turf fields. Richfield at Scott Ridge School and their Tiger Stadium from 2013 to 2021, Westport has four turf fields 
and Green Farms Academy just installed them as well. Weston and Darien in 2017, Danbury have turf fields since 2009. New Canaan stated in 2022 that the demand for their turf fields has increasingly raised revenues from events. The demand is so great that their revenues went up from $31,000 in 2019, $67,000 in 2020, $81,000 in 2021, and they also collected $93,000 from their own New Canaan sports organizations. Why is there such demand in so many towns considering converting to turf fields? They require less maintenance and water, drainage is improved, players have fewer injuries, less pesticides are required, and they're more reliable. Not only has Wilton's nonprofit Wharf worked closely and cooperated with the town, they have already donated $100,000, $180,000, and will be donating the $320,000 more. The next generation of the community in civic involvement has been so inspiring to watch, I have to tell you, as they bring all the parties together here in Wilton on this and all their other amenities that the town is looking for. The town should not miss this opportunity to enhance the ability of our young people to engage in more healthy athletic activities. And that's what I have to say about it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lucas Traub, and together with my wife, Olga Zorgos Traub, and our three children, we reside at 50 Wicks End Lane. As a coach and dad with children very involved in all facets of local sports, from the rec leagues through the high school sports, the addition of the Coconut House Field is not only personal, but very important and necessary for our children's mental health and physical health. Today is day five of all sports and all fields being closed uh, due to due to rain and, uh, and saturation. Um, this is not unusual, it's kind of a weekly occurrence. Uh, there, there was an entire season where our, our son um, basically you know, was unable to play uh, any home games and all our games were, uh, were scheduled for other towns um, around with, uh, with uh, suitable facilities. Um, we were forced to go to the surrounding towns and fields to, uh, to accommodate Wilton's not. While I appreciate the environmental concerns raised by some Wilton taxpayers, I recommend uh, I, I commend the efforts and due diligence for people by Adam uh, to address those concerns and ensure the safety of all Wilton's residents. We have such an incredible opportunity for Wilton as provided by the state of Connecticut in many of the terms of the lease for our town. I hope we do not squander this opportunity, and more importantly, I hope we can come together as a community to support the field that is desperately. Thank you to all of you for, uh, for all your support and leadership for this town. And uh, I ask for my fellow uh, residents to support this turf field and help us stay competitive in, in the sports community mm -hmm. and support our kids' uh, ability to play sports uh, with the proper facilities. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Matt Gilbert. I'm 92 Old Gloucester Road. I'm um, here tonight to speak on behalf of. Uh, I've got uh, three young children who I've had the pleasure of coaching and uh, seeing them, you know, trounce through the mud with uh, the, uh, the rain and also see them, uh, you know, light up with uh, just tremendous joy and having, you know, seeing an alternative in terms of what's out there and being able to play on, on the turf, which has been, you know, something of an eye-opener for me in terms of where they are and what the potential is for, you know, this facility, not only for, you know, the youth of, you know, Wilton in terms of, their development, but also for you know the next generations to come. Um, I appreciate uh, you know, Lynn's you know very uh, eloquent and insightful you know, review in terms of uh, presenting this information to the town. And I really can't uh, you know say enough in terms of Adam and the field and what it's going to do to not only the uh, the town, the sports, but the community at large bringing another opportunity for our children to express themselves in an innovative fashion, you know, both on the field as well as, you know, their individual efforts, and we look forward to, you know, supporting them, you know, as they continue to grow and develop. Thank you. It's Jason Partenza from 165 Cannon Road. Um, I'm a high school alum, uh, father of four students, volunteer president of the Women's Soccer Association, which serves small towns and families. 
regionally and a long time resident. We respect the upgrade and feel that Allen's are fully support. And I'd like to share some thoughts about what it, may, what it means to each of children, parents, volunteers, and taxpayers. From a child's perspective, when you're a kid, in most cases, your happiness revolves around your favorite sport or activity. It's the place where you feel free, where you meet new friends, and you grow. In this town, the infrastructure support that, the child will play and be happy. Our grass fields for youth are disparate, non conforming, difficult to maintain, and exposed to elements, and there's too few of them. When they are most needed, and unfortunately often closed because they can't endure the residents to play here. Closed fields rob the children the opportunity to play and grow, leaving them inside and not doing well. That's something that became a difficult existence for many during the pandemic, and it brought children to the break. We're still here in the early days trying to repair those wounds. To do this, we need as part of our portfolio of assets a weather resistant, always available, convenient, reliable, high capacity local sport and activity space for play. That's prioritized for our youth. Let's upgrade the existing field for the children of the From a parent perspective, again, I have four kids, but just like every family, schedules are busy and complex. A child's scheduled event is canceled because the infrastructure supported is not up to par with properly built in the first place. When that happens often, that's frustrating and extremely difficult to deal with. But it's also solid. This upgraded field will provide a solution that will make the lives of parents and families better and in turn support their kids who need this the most. Let's upgrade the existing field for parents and families. From a volunteer perspective, Volunteer parents spend countless hours each season to deliver accessible and affordable opportunities for play. I'm talking about high participation, recreational, and developmental in town programs for all. The required volunteer time and energy to coordinate a schedule for one team, one age group, one program is immense. Now, now translate that across many programs in town. Without proper field infrastructure, it becomes nearly impossible. There's a solution. Build a portfolio of fields and facilities that, number one, can handle current and future demand. Number two, is a balanced mix of turf and grass, outdoor and indoor, and is accessible, reliable, and durable. This field dramatically improves our standing in all respects. So let's build a field for volunteers who serve the children, who serve the families. And finally, the taxpayer. 20 seconds. Satisfied, fulfilled parents and volunteers and children mean more families staying here for longer and more than want to come here. When that happens, population rises, economic activity allows, and home values appreciate. This investment is a must. It's a must do now. It's the only one I've seen, maybe after the schools, that speaks directly to the heart of the soul of Wilton, our youth and its families. I thought deeply about this. All the considerations are this for and against. I'm available to all as a resource, as you consider your view. I like the Clean Center that we're standing in now, the only field that's across the street, trackside down the streets as well. This investment will pay dividends for years and years to come. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, yes, you might. Or you might. Those yes, yes, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you start, I just wanted to say I know that there's a number of people that still want to speak. Somebody has already spoken about the same topic that you want to, you can adopt their thing. I don't want to stop want to stop anybody from saying their piece, but on the other hand, you, if you're saying something that's consistent with what others have, if you could shorten it, your comments, that would be great. Sure, I'll be concise. Good evening. Good evening. Question. Sorry, I'm not going to, as the moderator, I'm going to take my prerogative on this and not not consider calling the question at this point. Good evening. My name is Joseph Matthews, so it's 24 hours to be away. Uh, two very quick points, I'll be concise. One is demand. It is clear that our two existing turf fields are woefully insufficient to meet resident demand. Wilton should seek to emulate the best that is offered in nearby towns, including New Canaan, Richfield, Westport, and Marianne, to name a few. While each and every one of these towns offers a large number of turf fields, both on an absolute basis and on a per capita basis, as measured by the number of children per year. Second point, environmental considerations. I don't see how this is any longer up for debate. The 
manufacturer represents that Sherfield does not include any above screening level PFAS chemicals. This statement was confirmed by independent third party laboratory testing. As I've been told many times, we must trust the science. If a parent is concerned about non if a parent is concerned about non existent chemicals in a turf installation, they can keep their children off the field. However, do not take away the opportunity for the rest of the families. In conclusion, let's not hide behind another 20 years of paralysis by analysis. I urge my fellow voters to vote yes for the Allen's Meadows turf field bonding proposal. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is J.R. Sherman. I reside at 82 Middlebrook Farm Road. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat everything everybody talked about. It's incredible. Um, but I do ask that everybody listen to what everyone's saying uh, and that we use this to trigger any research you want to do, go on the website, read all the work that Lynn and the team have done to make sure that this is a safe choice for the town of Wilmington. Uh, I've got three kids. Uh, one graduated and is uh, playing sports in college right now. I've got twin seventh graders. Uh, met my wife at Walter Shaw in fifth grade. <laughs> Both class of 88 graduates, um, and I've been involved in coaching uh, boards, sports, uh, since the day I graduated. It's, it's something that, uh, it's something that means a lot to me. So, <clears throat> uh, currently I'm the president of WARP. Uh, this is a group of Volunteers, as mentioned, that got together to represent all sports in town and give us a unified voice to work with the town to make the right choices, and this is one of them. Uh, without repeating everything everyone talked about, I think I owe a debt of gratitude to the school and to the athletics for teaching I mean, life lessons, right? Leadership but when to lead, when to follow, when to support, when to be part of something bigger than yourself, to maybe be a part of something that doesn't benefit you because it benefits others. It's the things that you learn going through sports, leading sports, playing, being a player, coaching, and it's a life lesson that you take with you forever. So I would just say this decision is one of many that we'll face over the next years. This is long, long decision process, but it's one that's critical for all the kids who are coming into this town, who have been to this town, the ones who have graduated, and the ones who are having kids again in this town. So please vote yes. It means a lot to everyone. Thank you. My name is Brian Scanlon. I'm at 95 Old Boston Road. I'm uh, also here to speak in support of the turf as a Father, as a volunteer coach, you know, I've been out in the fields many times. I won't go through everything, but this is certainly something that's uh, needed. As somebody who appreciates the outdoors and the open space we have here, I appreciate the research that was done and the facts that were presented today. And I hope everybody will continue to support uh, the term in light of all those facts. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, case report man, 15 West River Road. Um, I too have kids in the community that play sports. I have three young boys. Uh, I coach them in multiple sports. Work with a lot of you all who've already spoken. Won't again repeat things, but I want to take it from a different angle and think about what, why everybody chooses to live in Will. Because I can tell you, when we moved here 15 years ago from the city, we took a long, hard look at a lot of towns around right here. What we liked about Wilton was its diversity. Not only its diversity of people, socioeconomically, and interests. We're not a homogeneous group. And that's what I like about it. We have different views, but we all appreciate that. We have outgrown our sports facility. It's massively important to these youth to have a place to play. All we're asking is for everyone to think about it from their perspective. If it meant as much to you, if it was something else, you would want us to listen. And we would, because we're a community. Instead of dividing ourselves, why don't we come together to 
do something that will help all. Now, if you can't get on board with that and on board with helping the kids, do it for selfish reasons. It's already been talked about. If we have more amenities in this town, it's going to bring more people here. It's going to increase your property values. So, please think about this. I appreciate if you have an opposing opinion, but for the betterment of the town, please vote yes. Hi, my name is Mike Galligan. I live at 25 Hidden Lake Ridge. Um, in the interest of time, I will adopt a lot of what's been said so far. I am another father, another coach, another father of athletes, youth athletes, and a high school athlete. And I'm here to speak in support of the turf. I really, I, I just want to make one additional point because many have been said, and I think they've been said very well. Um, I do want to thank the board and Wharf um, for bringing this to light, and bringing this opportunity to life. I think it's a very real opportunity that we need to seize. Many of the families that have these athletes drive all over this county to take them to other fields, other towns. I spend Saturdays and Sundays in other towns all through the year buying my breakfast and my lunch and my gas in other towns. It's crazy. And if we could have a facility that not only serves our own youth, but eventually could also serve the larger community and host games here, we drive some of that traffic here, we let the Wiltonians stay here, and it's just a practical matter. It's, it's better, more convenient, less, less money going out, more money coming in. So I want that sort of ripple effect to also not be lost in the conversation. So again, please join us and vote for this really unique and important opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shonda Ray. I live at 120 Cyclist Hill Road, and I'm also here to speak in support of the turf. Within Wilton, I'm involved in many different organizations, but I stand before you as a mother of four student athletes, three in Wilton and one in college, as a plot of Wilton athletics. I'm also on the board of Warp, the president of Wilton Youth Field Hockey, and a high school field hockey coach. We all know youth sports are good for kids. The research is undeniable. There's physical health benefits, mental health benefits, and community-wide benefits. When we look to our experts, the Wilton Board of Ed, and look within the, board, the portrait of a graduate that they've developed, specifically at what it, what it takes to be a balanced, healthy human being, and how they've described a courageous, ethical leader, these are traits that our young students can learn and have reinforced on the sports fields when those fields are open when those fields are accessible. Unfortunately, many of our natural grass fields are in poor playing condition, often closed at the times that our youth athletes have the turf. The fields are late and those times are limited. Representing field hockey specifically, we've had a call within our community for greater offerings, more specific offerings, more off-season offerings, more practice days. We cannot meet those needs. We lack appropriate facilities and we lack the time for those youth athletes to play. We've offered practices on the Middlebrook tennis courts before those renovations. We offer practices on grass. Field hockey is by our league regulations at the youth level, must be played on turf, so we cannot play on a grass field. Yet our fifth and sixth graders practice every week exclusively on grass to their detriment. They enter each contest where they are unbelievably successful at a disadvantage. I think we can do better for our youth as we raise leaders, as we raise future citizens of this town, I hope. Let's give them the amenities that they deserve and that create those future leaders. Thank you. Keith Woods up on 5081 Hill Road. Uh, I sat at my desk today and sun came out and I got really excited because the kids get to get back out there but they didn't because they were closed. And I thought to myself, is Darian and New Canaan out there practicing today? And the answer to that question is probably yes, okay? I graduated this high school in 1996. I went to kindergarten here, and I went to high school here. Guess what's changed? Nothing, okay? It's time for us to start to make these upgrades and put the kids first and give them a voice. So let's get this done and vote yes. I'm Ashley Bear, a CD3 junior in Colorado. I do want to start with the amenities. Um, in the years that you have served our community, I have seen amazing. 
few changes um, particularly from the infrastructure which in my opinion is failing dreadfully across the town at all levels the change in our town has been amazing and i am truly grateful for the job you have done for wilton um, thank you so much um, wonderful thank you um i am here not to echo the previous speakers, but I appreciate everything that you said because I too was a coach. My kids were really young, both of them, twins, love soccer. I coached them. And then as they got older, we got into professionals. I was a manager and I was driving them everywhere. Not only them, but I made sure that we had a really large car so I could take them to work. Um, and it was a pain. And I remember the heartbreak. Um, so we extended the year. Um, one of the things I do know that my kids learned was the real disappointment. Not to have their needs met every time they didn't get what they wanted. Um, how to change fast. Games can cancel, practice is canceled. How do we shift? How do we make this work anyway? You don't get to do what you want to do. We're going to have to think on our feet. We're going to have to shift. Mindset, activity, do something different. You have other kids on your team, they're in the same boat. Let's shift mindset. It's a skill that I know it's a struggle to learn. It's an opportunity. It's hard. I don't want to talk about that. I want to touch quickly on VFOS. I want to touch quickly on the testing fact. The um, Norwalk River Watershed Association did hire a professional testing. I want to make that clear to the professionals, organization, they do testing, water testing um, regularly. They're, they just test for lower levels. So they did pick up PFAS, no, they didn't test in the same levels. Um, and I do want to touch on not the environment. I want to touch on PFAS. They're present in the turf itself because in the production of turf, PFAS are used to produce slip factor. That's what they do. It's minuscule, but it's there. Um, I also want to touch on injuries related to artificial 20 turf. seconds. Okay. Injuries related to artificial turf that exists, PCL, ACL, knee injuries, or injuries on artificial turf, ankle injuries. My daughter did break her ankle on grass, but she and the other player did not get concussions because they both landed on grass. Concussions are at an increase on artificial turf, regardless of infill. It happens. NFL, you know what? They replace the turf every two to three years. Time. Moses Alexander, 61 Rhymes Lane. Well, there are a number of other bonding items tonight, some of which uh, perhaps more important. And I'm here just to speak in support of a fire truck. Thank you, Moses. <laughs> Moscow, 16 Carrot Road here in Welton. My husband and I have been here for more than 50 years. We love this town. We love everybody here. I want to thank the Board of Selectmen, especially Lynn, the Board of Finance, the Board of Education, and I want to thank all of you. You make a difference in this town. You come and work hard and take care of children. They grow up and go away, and you may or may not stay here, but you remember, Wilton, it has such an incredible place for all of us to live. We have been here, as I said, for more than 50 years. We absolutely love it. We love the new neighbors. We 
young children who move into our neighborhood. It is an incredible town. Thank you all so much for all that you have done. I thank you, Ms. Cano, for the cordial of her place. I've been in this town for 10 years, not born and raised here. As you can tell, my kids I have two in second grade, one in third grade. I coach them in soccer in kindergarten and first grade. I grew up playing soccer on fields just like the ones you have outside Allen Meadows. And artificial grass probably got a ton of the um, BFAs in me. And anyway, and there are some things in the presentation that I know about that I don't think are 100% accurate. One of them is the $320,000 for infrastructure. That's not even close to um, the amount of money required to do the foundation around the bubble for the concrete pad, for the inflating and heating equipment, for the generator, for the parking lot, you have to increase. So there are a lot of numbers that in that $320,000 that are even close to being um, the real number, and then all the operating of the potential bubble and are gonna be a huge number. So I'm going to maybe suggest work, the $500,000 that you're gonna break down into 180 and 320 to throw it all into the first part of turning the field into artificial grass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nick Chimelli, 72 Sugarloaf Drive. Um, I'm a family of two young boys who are in the school system and play multiple sports. I'm also a member of the Warp Board and fortunate enough to be the president of Wilson Football and Cheer of just a radar of 50 families. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to the town officials who walked us through the process and showed us what's needed to bring an amenity to this point in the process. Uh, we've learned a lot and look forward to sharing with other groups in town how that can happen. Uh, but one thing I'd like to talk about tonight in terms of the benefit that hasn't come up is the improved quality of life this turf of life fields will bring to the community. What I want to stop have happening is kids having to practice the 9, 930 at night because there's not enough lights or turf field in the town. I want kids to come home on October night of the car ride home with mom and dad and say, here's what I learned today in my sport and with my friends, and I had fun. And I want to stop them having to say, practice wasn't fun because I couldn't see anything, because I had to make sure I wasn't stepping on rocks or looking for holes in the grass. The practice got moved around four or five times different spots on the grass field, and it interrupted the practice experience. And so kids are not learning the maximum life skills they can in that hour and a half, two hour session with their friends and coaches. And I want those volunteer coaches to have an amazing experience with those kids and not have to worry about lights and safety. That's why I'm in support of a turf field for this community, a turf field of lights. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrew Ryan, four time Belt Hill Road. Um, I came in sharing concerns with a few people who raised the same concerns, um, but I really appreciated everybody publicly expressing their opinions tonight. Uh, based on the presentation that I heard, a lot of those concerns have been addressed, and based on the comments made by people tonight, as well as the student athletes who at least changed one vote, I will be supporting the new turf field. Um, but there are other bonding items, so boring question time. Um, the projected interest rate in the past for bonding has always been around like 3.5%. What will it be going forward at this rate of 5 So we projected all our numbers at 3.5% going out to bond on the 16th of May. We're generally about 90% of treasuries. I forgot to check treasuries today. But I know what you do for a living, so you probably know treasuries. <laughs> I, I don't have it on there. Okay, but so we think we'll do better. Maybe the last time I looked, maybe three and a quarter, a little bit better. John, do you remember what Cheshire, Cheshire went, went out for the AAA? Yeah, but that's about where we'll be. Okay, uh, and the other boring question. So with the rate environment in the past, I think the reason why we do some of the bonding items is because we're trying to do the lifetime of the enhancements. So is that strategy going to change if rates continue to go up? Some of these items that are being pushed to bond in are pretty low. Why wouldn't we put in the regular board selectman budget instead of bonding? So the policy for bonding is it must be 250000 or above. Um, must have a life of at least 10 years. That's our current policy. It can certainly be reconsidered. Interestingly, last year the Board of Finance argued that we should lower it, but 
I kind of stood firm and so did the board of selectmen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. My name is Patrice Gillespie. I'm a 258 Silver Spring Girl. I'm a former Wilton Conservation Commissioner and I'm a bird watcher. And I'm here to speak on behalf of stakeholders that do not have a, a voice in this meeting. The aquifer that lies beneath Alice Meadows is very important. I, for one, uh, am concerned about the bird migrations that come to this area to sustain the, the foodstuffs as they migrate to their destination. Um, there are many people in this room who have enjoyed bird watching at and I'm concerned that lights and bubbles and crowds and plastic will adversely affect future generations um, in our appreciation of nature. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex Bartek. I live at 140 Cheese Spring Road. Uh, I appreciate the support for boards that have done for this project, and I, for one, am willing to pay in my taxes for this. But I also understand we're possibly cutting 10 teachers and custodial staff and other staff on the schools. I wonder where the board support is for maintaining the quality of our schools. Thank you. Steve, that's about six months. I rise in support of all the bonding proposals. I want specifically to talk about the plans for Alex Meadows. I really understand the concern expressed about bird migration, but I will tell you noise and other things are already present there because teams are flying there. That's part of the life of Alex Meadows. I do want to say that past weekend I had a chance to go to the high school field to see the uh, sixth grade hockey teams. I'm seeing the hockey lacrosse teams play. Uh, I haven't had a child involved in sports for uh, 40, <laughs> almost 40 years now. Uh, but I enjoyed watching what I saw. And what I saw was, in very rainy circumstances, turf field really stood up very, very well. I went and looked at Alan's Meadow at the same time. I would not want a child of mine to be involved in Alan's Meadow for those days. What I also saw, and I really want to underscore this, because it goes to the heart of what I also want to say, which is thank you to all of you for your volunteer service. You know how much time and energy it takes and how much work you put into it. What I also saw when I watched the lacrosse game was the extent to which coaches put their heart into what they do and how much they mean to the students that they coach and how much those students benefit from the thoughtfulness, the determination of those coaches to see them be their best. And to me, supporting those coaches in doing what they're doing for the children whom they are working with is as important as anything we do here. And for that reason alone, as well as the many other reasons I've been stated tonight that I'm not going to repeat, I support the construction of the turf field in Alice Valley.
years. Um, we're going to get extra life out of the ones that the two that we have now um, because they weren't used much during the pandemic. So it, it really varies with usage. Um, as far as the bubble, we haven't done any analysis of the bubble, of the cost of the bubble, only the, the infrastructure that would have to be installed now because it couldn't be installed um, after the tools have been installed. So we're not even there yet. That's, that would be, if this passes, that would be a next phase that would have to be evaluated and all of that work done. I'm not going to be here, but I've said it to Warp that you know the expectation is that they're going to raise the vast majority, if not all, of the money. And part of the analysis, of course, is the ongoing expenses. But we, we just haven't looked at it now because it's not on the table right now. It's only the turf to field that's on the table. So Warp would be responsible for the ongoing maintenance of the bubble in terms of the storage in the future. So all of that would have to be worked out. You know, whether or not for, uh, you know, honestly, if I was still here, the conversation I'd be having is, uh, first of all, you're going to do the analysis. How much are you going to collect in fees? Uh, what are you going to have to pay the state? What are all those expenses going to be? And part of the, the cost of the initial construction of the turf field doesn't include a sinking fund for the ongoing costs. Those are all conversations that have to be had. But surely some of that research has already happened in order to have, you know, be thinking of this long term. Uh, we haven't done that research, honestly, on the, the bubble because it's not on the table right now. And WARF's taking 100% of the risk of paying for infrastructure without knowledge of whether or not the, the bubble, seasonal bubble will ever move forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. James Lane, 20 friend of Maine, uh, 20 plus year resident. I really want to thank the boards for your uh, work and commitment to balance the Continued improvements to our community, realizing the fiscal uh, realities that we're experiencing. Um, I echo much of what was said uh, about the support of the turf field. Two things I really want to highlight though. One, the public private partnership nature of this uh, project, you know, the commitment from Ward to, to raise the funds to support this project. And really, for all these organizations to come together in support of this, I think that's you know, unprecedented. You know, we often compete as coaches and competitors in different sports, but to have all these different sports come together and support this, I think, truly speaks volumes. So I encourage you to all support this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I am Barbara Geddes from 296 Cannon Road. I'm not going to talk about the turf field. I'm not going to talk about the fire engine, which I miss and support. I'm going to talk about the school bond items. Uh, we have only two tonight. We have an elevator and a roof. I want to endorse a long-range plan for our schools. I had the privilege of getting a behind-the-scenes tour of schools recently. I'm an architect. And our schools are fabulous, but surprisingly needy and disappointing in their physical plant. We have environmental health issues there. We have energy issues, we have life safety issues, and a splendid program. And even as our population is going down, our stewardship of 1960s buildings needs to go up. So I would urge you for the million dollars tonight for the school, each year in the next 10 years, you're going to see that go 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. Just be prepared because we need to do that. So don't forget the interior environmental health is just as important as the fields. As a mother of scholars, thank you. So, to Barbara and the folks that clapped, um, you'll see when I when I get to the board of selectmen um, budget, we did use some of um, ARPA funds to fund a um, master plan. It's a ten-year master plan for the schools and the municipal buildings because they're a lot worse, <laughs> and, or some of them are. So basically what's in the five-year plan is expected spending and we're gonna assign what those projects are after we get the results of the 10-year plan. And so that's in, in our Q stage right now. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pat Margaret, I'm from Millstone Road, and uh, I have a PhD organic chemistry. I am uh, very supportive of the turf field in general. 
and our two kids, they got through the school and they just become years. So I clicked on the link to the report that you have referred to in your text. A total of 11 samples, eight surface water samples and three QMQC samples were submitted to complete environmental testing strategy. Based on laboratory test results, PFAS were not detected in the field and equipment lab samples at concentrations above laboratory reporting limits, indicating that no sources of cross contamination were identified in sampling methodology. Based on laboratory results, individual PFAS compounds were detected in six of the eight surface water samples at various concentrations ranging from 2 to 3.7 parts per trillion. So we heard today about that no detection was done. So, so I fail to understand uh, where in the report that would be. I, I just looked it up, so I might have missed some. So if you're talking about, you looked at the report that's on the town website. So, yeah. okay, so um, you should have seen in that report where they tested the discharge pipe for the, and I think it's called, the, the numbers in front of it is MH, maybe six, MH eight. So that means where they opened up the manhole to get into the discharge pipe. So those came back, um, as non-detected. And there's also another test where they came back at that. Now, this, the highest test was the stream that came down from the top of Catalpa and picks up runoff from all of those homes down Richdale, can't remember the other street, oh, Water King. That came up in the threes, and that's piped into the pond that also came up in the threes. And then we tested water over at the Olmstead Hill. I mean, so these are where you saw the positive, which you should have seen. I can look it up right now. Typically, when you do statistical analysis, you look for 30 samples to have a significant uh, number on the testing. So when people test for manufacturing methodology, for instance, and you would test the property in a production line, you need 30 samples. And that's how you get the statistically significant number. And here, I think you're referring to three samples that are delivering zero, and then we have six out of the eight. So I would encourage the group, and, and I'm very supportive of the turf field, but I would encourage you to look at the data and try to understand the data, because it states here that we are detecting PFAS. PFAS results in cancerogenic effects, reproductive effects, and many other non-healthy effects. I certainly do not want to have our children be on a turf that might have those effects. So I, I would encourage you to really study the report and also ask for the same data sheet of the materials uh, that are used for the turf field. The safety data sheet will inform you about the compounds that are used for the turf field. I know about the coconut, I think that's a great thing, but there are plastics. In bonding, there are plastics in the strands. So if we want to spend that amount of money, and I think we should spend those type of monies on our children, I think it's 20 seconds to do the study. And we need to maybe spend a little bit more time Okay, so thank you. We'll get your name. I just want to clarify, though, if you can stay at the mic. We took test samples, or the company that we hired took sampling of um, water over at the intersection of Allen's Meadow and Olmstead Hill Road. So whatever distance that, and that water hasn't even gone by a turf field yet. So I'm a little bit... Uh, I, I, guess confused. I think it's fine to rely on the representation, but usually the representation is supported by data and um, you know specifications. So there should be specifications, and then we can share ourselves, and then people can let their kids play on the field. And okay. I think that is a concern. All right, thanks. Thank you. Over here. Yeah. Um, 
my name is Andrew Chi. I live at 17 Calvin Road. And um, I mean, I've, I've been a coach myself at another time. Um, I grew up playing all kinds of sports. Got my first letter my freshman year of high school. Was recruited into the um, athletic team for um, the university. Um, so I'm very supportive of sports. And with the pandemic, I'd rather have my kids socialize with other kids if possible and on the fields on the trails and away from social media and the grass so the internet of things. Um, so that said, I had studied at four, and studied and trained at four different medical schools here in the United States. Uh, I trained over at Children's Hospital Boston, which is part of Harvard, it's an affiliate of Harvard Medical School, and also the Florida Hospital for Children, the Tufts University School of Medicine. I also worked for the Center um, for Siebert, Center for Biologic Scholars and Research at the FDA, and I also worked at the NIH. My mom is sitting here with me. She has been, she got her uh, PhD in pharmacology in 1974, years before the Ivy League schools allowed women to become undergraduates. So she's a pioneer in pharmacology for women. Um, she works in Cedar, it's like the Center for the, the Drug and Dog Issue Research. But they have to get for quite some time and then retire from there. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because. Unfortunately, there are many substances that may initially seem like they're okay, and then years later, we in medicine and other science find out they're toxic and they're carcinogenic. In the nearby town of Fairfield, there are a high number of carcinogenic items that were placed in the fields, which has caused considerable problems. You can easily find this in Connecticut Post and other newspapers. It took years of wrangling to get the studies done and to try to correct the problems. And when I was over at these two pediatric hospitals, of course, there were all these kids with cancer. And many of the cancers they got were environmental, up in the Boston area. And you can't imagine the grief that the families had. Now, I'm all in support of sports. I mean, my dad used to take me at 5 or 5.30 in the morning so I could go to 6 o'clock practice. I was usually practicing four hours a day, Monday through Friday, and I have weekend practice. Um, but if we want to talk about quality, we do have to consider risk. We always have to consider risk for any kind of product, for any kind of service, especially in the world right now, which is really falling apart around us. 20 we seconds. Consider risk. So I just have to ask you guys to really consider it. One peer reviewed you know, article is just one. In evidence based medicine, that's nothing. If it doesn't show cause and effect, if it's just a correlation study or something even worse, it doesn't mean anything. We need multiple studies to truly understand cause and effects. Thank you. I'm just uh, wanted to share the perspective of um, uh, a sports player. I grew up in Greenwich. I was a Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York uh, tri-state champion lacrosse player, so I understand the value. Uh, of, of sports, and I, I support that. Um, but uh, I also know that, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the Greenwich fields were contaminated. And it was during that time that I developed several autoimmune disorders that I'm still living with today. And I feel like, from my perspective, we owe it to our kids to know that the, where we are putting them to play is a healthy environment, and that we're also not affecting, you know, the entire aquifer with chemicals that are are detrimental. Um, and that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. So we may have notes at the microphone, so we will close the comment period. Uh, just a reminder on this is there will be voting on all of the bonding resolutions after uh, the town meeting and then at the adjourned town meeting as well. At this point, we will move on to the budget and I will uh, introduce Michael Kalin, Chairman of the Board of Finance for remarks on the fiscal year 2024 budget and building. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you,
Well, as David just said, I'm Michael Kalin. I'm the chairman of the Board of Finance. Raise the mic. And I'm raising the mic. Is that better? Well, I was actually going to use some of my time tonight to um, publicly praise Lynn for the work that she's done in the last eight years for us, um, because this is our eighth town meeting together when Lynn is first select woman. But I think this is also the longest <laughs> town meeting that we've had. So I'm going to do that another time, another place. I'm going to move right into it the Board of Finance budget, the budget that we're presenting to all of you tonight. And I emphasize that this is a budget that is presented to you for approval by the Board of Finance, not an individual member of the Board of Finance. Uh, the individual members of the Board of Finance, in addition to myself, four of them are sitting over there on the, I guess that's stage, that's for stage right uh, for you. Um, the gentleman with the tie and jacket on, next to the woman in the white jacket, is Rick Sinkowski. The person in the white jacket is here in the hotel. To her right is Chris Stroud, and to his right is Stuart Kornberg, who's the vice chair. And hopefully our clerk, Matt Ramondi, is watching the line. Now, as far as the budget goes, and I am going to be quick about this, um, the highlight, the high level, is that their Board of Ed budget we're recommending to you is $89.2 million. It's $2.5 million more than it was last year. The Board of Selectmen budget that we're presenting to you tonight is $34.5 million. It's um, $530,000 more than um, what it was last year. The debt service, and this is um, a meaningful change from last year. It's gone up 10%. It's gone up by um, $935,000, and it now amounts to about $10 million a year. Um, the use of the excess fund balance, that's what we have left over from the prior year that we can apply to this year to reduce the tax burden. Um, that is also smaller than it was when we put the budget together last year. Um, that's almost a $2 million decrease from what we were able to apply last year. The mill rate that we're recommending to you tonight is, um, I'm sorry, the mill rate levy, um, the $128.8 million you see on the screen is um, the money that we have to raise um, through the taxes um, to pay for our operating expenses for fiscal year 24. Um, the net taxable brand list, which is what we apply the mill rate to, has increased by $44.8 million, or about 1%. And the proposed mill rate that we're recommending to you tonight is 29.2608 mills, or a 3.66% increase. Now, um, what you see on the screen now is just a further breakdown of the highlighted numbers that I just gave to you with the specifics. The um, first column of numbers shows you what the fiscal year 23 budget, which you approved last year was. The fiscal year 24 proposed budget to the right of that is what we're proposing to you tonight. The difference between the two years is shown in the next column, and the percentage difference is shown on the column furthest to the right. The, the numbers I just gave you for education, selection, and debt service, um, you just saw in the previous screen, the reserves is basically just taking 1% of the numbers above it to set aside a reserve as a prudent financial measure and the total of those four line items gives us what is our total operating requirement. And what we're proposing this year is 
$1,934,952,000. Now, from this number, um, we add in tax relief, and then we subtract non-tax revenue, such as fees and grants, and then um, you see the use of the excess fund balance, which is what I referred to, is much smaller this year than it was in the previous year. The um, mill rate levy that we get to is the amount of money that we have to generate by applying the mill rate to our grand list. And then below that, you see the, um, the grand list, and then we call it the collectible grand list because we apply a collection rate of 99.3% um, to the entire grand list, the value of the properties that are on the books with the town, and then um, applying the right formula, we get to our 29.2608 mill rate increase for this year. Um, just to just get a sense, um, proportionately looking at the pie charts um, of where the money is going and how we raise the money. Um, you can see, and again, these numbers just came from the previous two slides. The Board of Education budget we're recommending to you is $89.1 million. Municipal services is everything other than the schools. So it's police, fire, public works, social services, health, recreation. And then you see also in terms of what we have to pay for, we have the debt service of $10 million, um, which is up this year. And um, then you also see the charter authorities that excess fund balance that um, we were talking about before. The, um, on the right, you see um, where the money is raised from. 129 million is raised from the mill rate being applied to the grant list. The other revenue, the, the fees and grants of 5.7 million and that reserve drawdown, which is what I was talking about before, is the 1.6 million. If you just want to get um, an historical perspective of where we've been in terms of the mill rate, and this is showing the mill rate as being between um, a low of, I'm guessing it's probably 26 um, to a high this year of pretty close to 30. The recommendation that we're making to you tonight is that we um, adopt, that you adopt um, an overall operating budget for fiscal year 24, 2024 of $134,951,947, and that um, we raise $128,830,004 of that through the mill rate, and then we um, have recommending to you the 29.2608 mill rate, and that's our budget. Um, recommendations to you tonight and with respect to the bonding um, referendums that we talked about previously the those are presented to you by the Board of Selectmen they the Board of Selectmen before they present them to you present them to the Board of Finance to give us an opportunity to object to them if there was a reason for us to object to them and when we met and deliberated on it, we had no objections to it. So with that, I think I'm introducing the first selector. Why um, Mike's a lot taller than me. <laughs> so why I'm queuing this up I, um, in the interest of time, if you looked at, uh, clicked on the link 
from yesterday's update. There were a lot more schedules, uh, slides for the bonding presentation, but expecting a lot of comments. I uh, didn't go through them, but there is one thing I would like to mention. You know, Mike said interest rates, uh, the debt service went up, and yes, that's because we are borrowing from the police headquarters. Um, in 2018, we had what was the high debt probably ever, which we had outstanding debt at 84.3 million, even with the borrowing of the police headquarters and with the plan uh, going forward, we're not gonna get any higher than 77 million. You know, when I was on the board of finance, we always wanted to keep it under 80 million, so I'm happy that we're able to do that. And one of the big reasons we've been able to do that is um, we've received grants for $33 million for projects that otherwise would have been bonded. That's an absolutely unprecedented amount of money. Part of that is because there's more money out there um, because of some of the federal and state programs. But also, I just want to applaud our uh, DPW director when we hired him in 2019 as our town engineer and deputy DPW director. He got right on this. There was a, a program for uh, bridges. Uh, the state came in and they evaluated all the bridges and we had a lot of bridge work to do. And we received $23 million. He got in line first. That money started to run out, but we were, as I say, there early. Fortunately, the legislature is talking about the budget of um, putting more money in for the next couple of years because we still have more work to do and everybody else that was behind the curve has work to do. But, you know, some other things, the pedestrian bridge, finally done. Um, we've, we've been able to invest a lot of money in the NRBT. Um, the emergency communication system for public safety and um, the Wilton High School complex, uh, the, new, the, the reconstruction of the drainage system. None of that is going to be paid through the property taxes because we received those $23 million in grants. So, just that good thought. And we keep looking for more. So I'd like to first introduce my fellow Board of Selectmen members, Second Selectman Josh Bowman and Rick Todd. Uh, sitting to the right of him is Kim Healy. Uh, all the way at the end in the light colored shirt is Bass Mabulsi. And then to Bass's left is Ross Chartel. So thank you to my fellow members and I present this on their behalf and on behalf of the town employees. So the fiscal year 2024 request is 34, almost 0.5 million. Uh, the request is 530,000 uh, more than last year. It's 200,000 less than we asked the Board of Finance for. It's okay, we knew you were gonna do it. Uh, and it's about a 1.56% increase versus 2023. The four year average annual increase is 0.46%, which I don't expect you're going to see that in the future. Um, part of that was the reductions that we made during COVID and a lot of things that were shut down as a result of COVID. But our eight-year average annual increase is 0.79%. If you've been coming to these meetings, you know that we've made a lot of significant changes in municipal operations. We combined some positions with the Board of Education to save money. Uh, we made, uh, back in 2021, uh, for fiscal year 2021, we did it just before uh, July 1 start. We changed the medical benefits for the employees. That had a huge impact. It was like almost $700,000. So for us on our budget, you know, that's almost a 2% change. So, um, and we've done a lot of initiatives. That's been a big focus of reducing costs. And that's why you see such a low average annual increase. The drivers of the spending increase this year are wage increases, non-union um, general wage increase and incentive compensation. We have a pool that's equal to 2.75% of non-union wages. Our union contracts, the wage increases are anywhere from two and a quarter to two and a fourth 
22.75. That's the general wage increase. Uh, we have one additional police officer in the budget this year. Um, we had been at 45 officers back in 2015, probably, I forget if it was 2016 or 2017, we went down to 44, but we've seen a significant increase in, um, I guess, problem driving, I would describe it, and we've heard from a lot of residents asking that they want more attention spent on um, traffic enforcement, so um, we're adding an additional police officer. Our medical benefits are increasing by five and a half percent. They're budgeted for that. Um, as I said, we changed medical benefits for our employees with fiscal year 21, and we're still lower. We're nine percent lower than um, in our total budget for medical than we were the year before we made the change. Uh, we do have savings in this budget. Biggest savings is in our pension contribution. Um, we're now over 100% uh, two years in a row. Um, so there's been about a 450,000 plus reduction in our defined uh, benefit pension contribution. All new employees are on defined contribution other than uh, firefighters. Uh, we also, uh, as we've had a number of retirements over the last few years, and as we bring in employees, uh, new employees, they come in um, at a lower rate than those that replace. Our union employees, you have a wage scale, and then you hit the max, and, and you don't uh, get increases for years of service. Somebody comes in, usually at the lowest, maybe if you're a lateral hire, you might come in at third, third step. Um, but so that, that saves us money. And also in reaction to the reductions um, from the Board of Finance, we are increasing um, program fees for Park and Rec to absorb more of the overhead. Um, we don't allocate 100% of overhead when we uh, develop those fees. So this is a breakdown. We can see the impact of the pension contribution. It brought wages and benefits down to only a 1.2% increase despite what I told you about um, what those um, pay increases will be. Um, not much else to say about everything else. All of the costs, we have some anticipated vacancies. But right now, I'm sad to say we're at 41 police officers right now against the 45. So we, we budgeted all the police officers, all 45 of them in the district, but we know it's gonna take us some time. Um, to be able to fill those uh, positions. So that's some of the vacancy that we budgeted there in savings. So just like with bonding over the last uh, couple of years, uh, the Board of Selectmen has designated some of our ARPA monies, and also we had prior year savings, primarily related to COVID, um, and we've invested it in infrastructure. So this list is projects that have been funded through those sources. It's about, it, we funded more than two million. I don't have all of them here, but kind of the, the you know, bigger ones here. Um, and they're either in process, like the uh, parking lot at Shanks, that construction's happening. Um, we've already repaved Quarry Head. I think we're finished with that. But these are all things that are happening Again, not running through any budgets because um, they're being, or any additional budget because they're being paid for with grants or savings that we had in previous budgets. Um, things to definitely think about for the future. As I said, the police shortage, it's very concerning. Um, we're having difficulty, every town is having difficulty and we're all competing for the same people. Um, and so, you know, we've had some officers that are leaving New York City, which is great because then we um, are able to bring somebody in that doesn't have to spend nine months in the academy. Um, but um, we're losing a lot of those offers to communities that have a defined benefit plan. That's just the truth. They're coming from another um, 
municipality that has it. So we're working hard. We've got an amazing police department and um, our new chief, Tom Conlon, is doing a great job. But this is something that's very concerning. Are we ever going to be able to hire enough um, police officers to fill all of the positions? Other area of concern is the state potentially pushing down part of the cost of the teacher pension. Uh, municipalities in Connecticut don't pay any of that expense. It's paid 100% by the state. For Wilton, the state funds over 11 million in pension costs for our teachers. Um, Malloy, in his final years, floated the idea of pushing it down to municipalities, and particularly the more wealthy municipalities. There's a lot of argument up in Hartford that this, by the state funding it, they're disproportionately uh, helping wealthy communities because wealthy communities pay their teachers more and therefore their teachers get a bigger pension. So the spotlight had been on it, kind of died down a bit, and the spotlight is back. I think this is a real risk at some point that um, this might happen. Um, and then there's a lot of things being discussed right now in the state legislature that are still bills being considered. Um, I'm not gonna go through them because I don't know what's gonna pass and what's not gonna pass, but a number of them have new costs to um, the town. It happens every year, but there seems to be a particularly long list of items this year. So just so you're aware. Just threw this in because I just had to get, <laughs> keep getting asked the same questions over and over again. So why don't we install some solar? in Wilton, I get that a lot. So 70% of all our municipal and school building needs are met by solar. Either the solar that's on the roofs of our schools or solar projects that we have sponsored in another community and we get the virtual net you know, metering credits. So, um, and we are also exploring solar installation on the um, landfill at the transfer station. So. You know, we're getting pretty close to being maxed out, but that it, we're great, you know, and so we've been that way since I think 2020 was when we um, did the last um, virtual net metering field. Uh, we piloted the school, uh, the food scrap program at the transfer station. I think we're gonna end up with a bill this year that is probably gonna make it mandatory, but not for another seven or eight years. But um, that's, that's helpful, it's a lot of our waste is food scrap. Uh, the status of the cell tower at the bus barn that is in front of it, the, it's, already, it's been filed, it's with the Connecticut Siting Council. If you don't, uh, didn't see my April update, it's on there, it, it gives the information about when you can give public comment on that. Can we have a town pool at Burns Meadow or Shanks Island or ice hockey rink, you name it, whatever. It is. They're both federal floodplains. You cannot build a building on Shanks Island or on uh, Merlin's Meadow. So when we did do the POCD, we spent 18 months on that, and um, quite honestly, a town pool was not recommended as uh, a priority. So just wanted to get those two things out there. That's it. Thank you. The entire board is with me. I'd like to introduce Jen Lala, Nicole Davies, Pam Haley, Laura Charge, and Mandy Smith. Thank you to Superintendent Smith and his entire team for their hard work, dedication, and skill in building the budget. A special thank you to CFO Tom Norton and Marianne Salvato in the business department and Lucille Denovio for countless hours of work behind the scenes and behind these slides. Wilton is many things. We are Wilton strong, we are one town, one team, we have pride, and as countless community conversations begin, 
with me moved here from the schools. Most importantly, Wilton educates. We have made it our mission to inspire and prepare all students to contribute meaningfully to a globally interdependent society. We value the safety and wellness of students, bringing joy in teaching and learning, personalizing instruction to meet the needs of each learner, strengthening our community, stewarding the environment, cultivating productive partnerships with students and families, creating learning experiences that are challenging, authentic, relevant, and meaningful. And as a community, we expect excellent results at a great value. We educate, and we do it well. Under the leadership of Superintendent Smith, the Wilton education system is delivering on our mission, values, and community expectations. According to the 2022 Next Generation Accountability Index conducted annually by the state, Wilton is the best performing district in the state. We are preparing our students for success in college, career, and life better than any other district. And the accolades continue. Indulge me as I name a few. In 2022, Cider Mill was a school of distinction. Middlebrook was the third highest performing middle school in the state. And Wilton High School was the fourth highest performing high school in the state. This year alone, we have 12 National Merit finalists and 29 National Merit Commended Scholars and 14 Division I bound athletes. We won a total of 17 medals at the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards of Connecticut. The high school debate team plays first in the varsity state championship final. The varsity girls lacrosse team is currently ranked ninth in the nation, and the boys have cracked into the top 25. We have seniors entering an impressive list of four-year institutions, including Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, Georgetown, Amherst, and Boston College. We have seniors choosing to study and serve at West Point. The Wilton Public School System is a human capital education enterprise organized and operated to advance our mission, values, and expectations. Education is a dynamic enterprise. Schooling today is not the schooling of yesterday, and it will be different tomorrow. We need to understand and meet the challenges of our times. We need to be prepared to respond to rapid shifts in technology and how kids experience the world, their environment, and relationships. The system cannot stand still. Excellence comes from a place of acknowledging we can all always do better and be better. From the superintendent to the custodian, all positions operate to run programs in service of each learner. Each child who walks through our doors gets one chance at each grade. Our program is working. And where our program isn't working, we adapt, adjust, and evolve. Student growth and achievement across the district is remarkable. On February 16th, the BOE unanimously approved 23-24 budget. On March 27th, as chair, I presented the BOE approved budget to the Board of Finance. The school budget is a monetary expression of our mission, values, and expectations. And every line of the budget reflects the considered judgment of our superintendent and this board about how best to organize our program and resources in order to sustain, protect, and nourish our achievements and investments. The approved budget was a maintenance budget, and currently, maintenance costs more. The request was $90,581,692 and represented a 4.5% increase over last year. The higher than usual ask was a direct reflection on the current economic environment and represented the minimum to operate the next school year without compromising the services and programs we currently provide. On April 3rd, the BOF reduced the BOE budget by $1.4 million. The budget request before the town is now $89,181,692 and represents a 2.8 nine percent increase year over year. I am hoping that pending the outcome of tonight and adjourned voting, that this is where the budget will stay. The prospect of less is daunting. The budget is no longer a maintenance budget. It is less. We cannot maintain current staffing levels and programs. We are making hard choices about staffing and services across the entire district. No one program will be eliminated, 
We are taking a holistic approach and doing our best to keep the reductions small and dispersed. But the loss of $1.4 million has a large effect. We will be changing the district's health care carrier. We currently estimate the first year savings of about $100,000 to $150,000 and total savings over three years of about $1.1 million. We are looking at making reductions to the summer program and our curriculum days, the custodial staff by one FTE, custodial substitutes and clerical support, cafeteria aids and summer clerical days, training and conferences and professional development support, library books and furniture replacement. We are also looking to defer the replacement of 100 staff laptops and take minor reductions to the special education service lines. We are also looking at staff shifts and reductions. Maintaining class sizes at the lower end of our planning range remains a top priority, along with protecting intervention needs and mental health support. We will thoughtfully reallocate, adapt, and adjust staffing. The BOE approved budget accounted for the schedule change at Middlebrook, which facilitates the long sought time and space for, for more, more, more math and to combine reading and writing into one integrated program. This change allows the district to shift nine positions across the entire district to protect our staffing priorities. The shift provides space in the budget for positions previously covered under the ESSER grant that remain vital to student learning. Those positions include 1.45 full-time interventionists, one full-time mental health professional, and two full-time classroom teachers at Miller Driscoll. The shift also supports one full-time STEM teacher at Middlebrook and the enrollment needs for two, class, two full-time classroom teachers at Cider Mill and one full-time pre-K teacher and one full-time pre-K paraprofessional. We are also looking at making additional staff reductions, including eliminating the equivalent of one certified FTE at the high school, eliminating an instructional coach at Miller Driscoll, eliminating a .6 strings instructor for one year at Cider Mill, eliminating a .5 science paraprofessional support to Cider Mill and Miller Driscoll, reducing the director of digital learning position by .4, eliminating 1.5 library paraprofessional FTE, and reducing teacher stipends for clubs, activities, and intramurals by 50%. Currently, total FTE loss stands at 6.6. .6. And what about costs per pupil? Per pupil expenditure does not tell us how much a school system spends to educate each individual student. Some students cost more and some cost less. No student is turned away and all benefit. Cost per pupil solely measures the total cost of the system per each student enrolled. And it does not often correlate to the overall quality of a program. If enrollment declines, district per pupil spending typically increases even if programs, infrastructure, and service levels stay the same or improve. A school can even have a year-over-year -year lower budget and still show an increase in per-pupil expenditure. Under both PPE models used by the state, we are within our district reference group average. Over the last eight years, 2015 to 2022, the average increase in our budgets is a lean 1.27%. Over the last nine years, Wilton's annual budget growth rate is almost half than our next closest comparable district. We stand at 13%, and then West End and West Porter at 24%, Darien is at 26%, Buchanan is at 28%, and Richfield is at 30%. The change in average growth for fiscal year 24 as Willen at 1.66%, with Weston next at 2.45%, and Richfield at the top with a little over 3%. What could our program be? Improvements could be made at a faster rate. Students and teachers could have more targeted support and enrichment. Principal requests for more staff and support wouldn't be consistently denied. Budgets wouldn't be frozen in September, and needed purchases wouldn't be pushed or delayed. There is only so long you can do more with less. Degradation over time is real. We are now reducing staff and services. We no longer have to pause and ask ourselves what a reduction would do to our programs and services. We are living it. 
With the new reduced budget, we have the lowest percent budget increase for 23-24 in our district reference group. Despite the budget challenges, we will hold steady and stand ready. We will protect, sustain, and nourish our achievements and investments. We will protect and sustain. We will work to narrow unfinished learning gaps by keeping class sizes at the lower end of the planning range. We will shift staffing positions to best match student and program needs. We will keep our staff ratios in line with similar towns and provide our world-class teachers with world-class professional development. We will work to secure a safe, positive, and inclusive school climate. We will focus on social and emotional learning and mental health to ensure our kids are able to access curriculum and fully participate in the life of the schools. We will support our students with special needs. We will continue our work aligned to the portrait of a graduate. We will nourish. We will continue to hire the best teachers and invest in our teachers. Professional development takes many forms, from coaching to workshops, to support for advanced degrees and specialized training and certifications. We will work to raise overall growth and achievement in both academics and the arts. We will continuously improve how we implement the accelerated learning model, using data to inform classroom instruction, practice, and learning. We will support program and curriculum development by embedding illustrative math across the lower schools, refining our reading program, integrating reading and writing, at Middlebrook and developing a new STEM course at Middlebrook. We will offer new courses at Willing High School, such as Physics II, Advanced Audio Production and Podcasting, Advanced Placement Research Seminar, and Honors for American Sign Language. We will cultivate our arts and sports programs and look to create new experiences beyond the classroom. We will push forward the curriculum reviews of STEM, science, social studies, and integrate the findings. We will balance our mission, values, and community expectations within the budget. We will hold steady, we will be ready, we will protect, sustain, and nourish our achievements and investments. We will keep the promise of why people move to Wilton. Wilton educates, and a Wilton education is priceless. Thank you for your time and support. First of all, timing, uh, everybody is entitled to three minutes. Secondly, uh, please refrain from cheering, clapping, or other forms of participation. And third, please remember to clearly state your name and street address if you wish to speak. With that, uh, the microphones are open. Yes, to my right. Alan Davis, 3 Sight Road, Wilson. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Why did the Board of Finance feel compelled to cut $1.4 million from the Board of Education's maintenance budget? Thank you. 
The reason I personally cannot answer your decision, and I'm sorry, answer your question, is because this was a board decision made by the individual members of the board collectively after studying the Board of Ed budget, not just what was presented this year, but we've been studying it for years. And we discussed it together, we deliberated it together, and ultimately voted as a body. So each one of us may have different reasons for why we personally voted for it, but that's not what the result is. The result is what the board collectively is presenting to you tonight. Do I still have, do I still have time? Excuse me? Do I still have time? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, is there a way that we, the, member, the, the, the citizens, could be given alternative choices? Like, this is option A, this is option B, um, and just we have the opportunity to use our judgment to determine how much our Board of Education should be funded. Well, that's the purpose of this meeting, is that, and, and the town vote after this meeting, is that you will have three options as it relates to the budget. Uh, first of all, there's an option right now to reduce the, uh, uh, the, the Board of Education budget that's the one that you're specifically speaking to, and that's with the filling the <coughs> blanks procedure. If that were to carry by the annual town meeting, then that would become what is being voted upon at the voting subsequent to the annual town meeting. The annual, after at the voting, you'll have a choice to either approve the budget as, uh, as proposed, which may be amended, to vote no because it is too low, or to vote no because it is too high. And if the amount, based, first of all, if 15% of, of the uh, potential participants uh, have voted uh, uh, in fact, and if a vote no, either be, uh, too high or too low, is greater than those that approve the budget, then it would go back to a further deliberation uh, by the Board of Finance and the, and the uh, Board of but so there is no alternatives that can be presented at this point. That's the process that the charter requires. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Patricio Misitrano, 24 Juniper Place. I moved to Wilton because of one reason the schools, and then we stay for the schools and the community. I have two daughters in second grade and one in third grade. One of them. Um, works with an interventionist that is going to be cut off in our cars. And I watched the Board of Finance, I'm sorry, I don't know your names, and some of the gentlemen said that they would not vote to reduce it 1.4 if that meant reducing teachers' services. So that's not what's happening. As we saw in the presentation, there's a lot of reductions, and the 1.4 is going to be cut across the entire board, which means less teachers and less services for all the, the students. So congratulations. That was being sarcastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. David Hackner, 62 Goldman Road. I'm reluctantly known to support the uh, budget as presented. Um, I witnessed this past end of winter and spring when a very thoughtful and very needed uh, budget was presented by the Board of Education. Um, unfortunately, there was a contingent within the Board of Finance that brought an agenda to cut whatever budget was going to be presented to it. They wanted to get back to their constituents and claim that they took, took down the budget, even though it was needed by professionals, to determine that it was needed by professionals on the Board of Education. Um, specific items within the budget were questioned by individuals who don't have a background in education, so it was pretty upsetting. Um, but nonetheless, and, and upsetting in that the, the increase is less than the inflation. So it was presented as a maintenance budget, and we're getting even less than that. So um, it's unfortunate, but that's what we have right now. And uh, so it's not to see it getting lower. Uh, I'm going to support the budget as it's being presented. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Andrew Ryan, 410 Belton Hill Road. Sorry, three minutes, not enough time. Uh, for the critics of the, uh, the Board of Finance, um, 
decision, and I am one of the critics. Um, our decisions were data-based. We saw the Board of Ed presentations. We, uh, I won't repeat it, I only have three minutes, but the data shows the budget cut is too significant. We need to vote, no, it's too low. In terms of um, some of the other justifications for cutting the budget, please speak publicly if you have an opinion against the budget or if you are for the budget. We can't have decisions being made of people spoke publicly or they email and people refer to majorities that are not speaking publicly. If you have an opinion, please feel free to express it so we can all know where everybody stands on the budget process. Finally, for the reductions to the budget, they were referred to as insignificant. The biggest drivers of the decrease is health insurance and intramurals and the clubs that are being performed. A lot of people spoke about sports tonight. We need to also support the kids that don't participate in sports, and this is the only way that they're able to get their social interactions. And health insurance really matters who your provider is. So my company offers two different health providers. I have a son who's autistic, who's four years old. One would not cover services, one would. So I'm fearful for the teachers who will now have to make tough decisions if health insurance is gonna change for them and they're not gonna be able to get the services that they need for themselves or their children. Thank you. Please no clapping, please no clapping. next year, when we are speaking to the freshman class, that we can say without certainty that they will find a place. Every year, the PTSA president and the high school students, when addressing parents and students in their moving up addresses, say over and over, don't worry, your children, your children will find their people in high school. There are so many clubs and activities that they will find a place to fit in. Trust me, there is something here for everyone. And if they and if they don't, they can grab a few people, a sponsor, and start their own club or activity. There are so many students that fill our student body that are not a part of sports, that are not a part of the music department, and not the honor students. They need to feel that they belong. And now I'm worried that half of the club budget is being cut, that some of those kids are going to be left out and lost. In a time when the mental health issues are at the highest, this is a huge concern. All of our students need to feel they belong. Some of you mentioned that you believe coaches are unnecessary. Let me give you an example of the importance of coaches. With AI taking off and the rate for which we are constantly changing and advancing, we as a school and our teachers need to be versed in how to handle in a classroom and through the curriculum. It will be our coaches in the seminars, workshops, investigating and coming back to our teachers and teaching them what they learned and how they can handle this rapidly evolving situation. With no coaches, this process would fall on our already overworked teaching staff. It wouldn't get done, or the teachers would have to take time out of the classroom to be learning how to address it, and this would end up in lost teaching time. This is one of the many, many reasons coaches are helping our school. The BOF, I ask you please to be more present in our school. Attend our PTA meeting. Participate, participate in long-term planning. Go to the parent planning meetings at the beginning of the BOP budget. Ask to attend personal development staff meetings. Listen to what is needed. Listen to all the items and areas that are not even close to being addressed in this budget. Listen to where we as parents that move into this town or the schools want for our kids and are willing to pay for it. I am support of the original budget, but I'll be voting for the 1.4 million cuts in fear of it being cut more. I would ask you please, though, next year, to leave that decision up to our town by putting seconds. the original budget on the ballot and letting the people of this town decide. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please stop, please.
big staff that has already come up with what was thought out budget. I will go through the existing budget and create a few more. I feel like the Board of Finance did us a disservice for this meeting allowing the county to have a budget that we saw in the county at the time and will work on that professional for changing the budget. Thank you. They're the ones that ultimately decide the package of budget and funding. Is that correct? Yes. There would be a revise. There would be a continued town meeting at that point, and there would be then yet another process to for the. Yeah. Where do we let Ira? Because it's all laid out. To town yeah. This is all governed by the charter. Um, don't forget, you need fifteen percent. To to. Uh, to have it passed as a projected budget. If that happens, it goes back to the Board of Finance uh, for a, a re, re assessed, a re reconsidered, I guess it's called in the chart. It's all set out in the chart, a reconsidered budget. And the section says that the Board of Finance will consult with the Board of Education and with the Board of Select. And then the Board of Finance will make another, consider, uh, another judgment on a reconsidered budget. They can reduce it, or they can increase it. Um, there is then another section which allows the uh, Board of Selectmen to have essentially a veto power over that Board of Finance reconsidered vote by a vote of four members of the Board of Selectmen. And they have to, I think, find other places to reconsider. So it gets a little bit complicated. It then goes back to a reconvened town meeting like this. And the town meeting will then basically vote and decide. And I think that's where the process ends. Thank you for that. I would just like to point out that it seems that we have a board of finance that has, throughout the deliberations this season, made it very clear their stance on the budget for the board of it. And so if voting no to still run the risk of it going back to them for final deliberations, and they have not shown any interest in creating a new budget, despite a lot of outspoken there from all of these town meetings. I'd just like to state that that seems stacked against parents and the board of it. I just want to point that out to everyone here. So even though I fully support the board of it and I want the higher budget, for fear that our board of finance will cut it further, For educational experience, I'll be able to support the budget. A final comment ahead of time is that at the last meeting with the Board of Finance, a few gentlemen there um, rather facetiously mentioned that even though we were cutting by $1.4 million, they would be writing checks to the Board of Ed to support them by the cut that was averaged by each taxpayer. I hope they remember that and I hope they send in their checks. So thank you very much for supporting the Board of Finance. Thank you. In for a turf field, for a turf field. Yet your kids spend eight hours a day in a school with mental health issues, anxiety. These kids are struggling, but you'll cut the school budget, but you'll support one point eight million dollars for a turf field. I just I don't see the correlation. So I don't.
it was vote for the budget as presented. And I have no fear. I have two kids that are going to graduate this year, and I could walk away and say, we're done. I can vote as presented. Um, I, my heart is sick. I, my heart is sick. One point four million dollars. My kids will be in the food services. Um, we would struggle at times if we had not had interventions, if we had not had those services, mental health services, especially these last few years. Um, one of my kids would not have made it. So we're cutting an interventionist. Our mental health services are going to be affected. And I am torn. I am so torn, Dr. Stein. I can't, there's part of me that says, I can't say this is okay by supporting the budget as presented. Because I know there are kids who may not make it. And yet, I have officially lost hope in our board of directors this year. And that pains me terribly, because I'm not moving out of town. My kids are going to college, but I'm not moving out of town. And I need to trust you, and I have lost faith. And that grieves me. Just to clarify, Barbara, we're not reducing an interventionist position, we're reducing a coach position. Okay, good to know, thanks. Yes. Hello, my name is David Mentee, I'm a 33 temporary dean, and just wanted to state that I'm disappointed that the original board of head budget was uh, reduced. Also wanted to thank all the parents who came out in the other meetings uh, to voice their opinion. One takeaway for me, to get more involved and spread the word because many of us are working um, uh, with babysitting challenges, things like that, uh, but clearly this is impacting us and we're not doing a good enough job at voicing what I think the majority opinion is. So um, thank you for, for everyone's efforts. Thank you. My takeaway is I need to get more involved to get my neighbors to actually show up. Thank you. Paul Burnham, 239 Thunder Lake Road, Wilmer. Um, I, am, I stand in support of um, uh, the original budget that was presented to the Board of Finance. I am disappointed in the Board of Finance. I was formerly a member of the Board of Finance back when I had uh, most of my hair. Um, 23 years ago, and it was a different color. Uh, my children are in their late 30s. My daughter celebrates her 40th birthday later this week. Um, I have always been a supporter of the Board of Education's budget, um, and I'm thoroughly disappointed and almost disgusted by the Board of Finance's uh, approach. I um, I speak uh, with a little bit of knowledge, having served on the Charter Revision Commission uh, with another member of the Board of Finance, um, who will remember this, that uh, there was a movement on the Charter Revision Commission that some of us sought, which was to allow the townspeople to actually overrule the Board of Finance. Uh, and that was unfortunately uh, uh, voted down within the nine members of the Charter Provision Commission. I think this is a time when the townspeople should be given the opportunity to say to the Board of Finance, no, you're wrong. But if we vote no to low at this
this point. It goes right back to the Board of Finance. And if the same four members, not six, but four members, maybe even three members of the Board of Finance decide to stick with their guns and vote in the same way that they did previously, the townspeople have no choice. They have to accept it. So four people, four of our 18,000 residents of the town of Wilton have the ability and the authority to make a decision that affects the entire town. It's an unfortunate aspect of the charter, but it is what we live with. Now, to comment on the comments of the town council, the business about the Board of Selectmen having some level of authority over the Board of Finance is only with respect to the Board of Selectmen's budget. It has nothing to do with the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Tom Dexter, Grayson County Green. As I listen to all this, you know, I think we all have to recognize we might have a revenue problem, and we need to find ways, alternatives, ways to raise money for some of these programs that are being cut. In the case of athletics, we have booster clubs and other private monies that go towards supporting, and in some cases, we have private funds that support over 50% of our athletic money. Is there a mechanism here in town that we can do that for, whether it's STEM or special services or whatever the case may be? Do we have the mechanism to actually go out and raise specific monies privately for these types of needs? So when we come to situations like this, I know we're all frustrated, but, you know, we're presenting a problem. Maybe we can present a solution. Is that a solution? I know that higher education, colleges and universities, public, are relying more and more on a public-private partnership or private funds to fund their operations, fund their education. Do we have the ability to do something like that here is my question. And if not, you know, or if we can, why aren't we doing it? Tom, yes, you can. There is all of the PTAs, the PTAs, they all do fundraising all day long. The World Med Foundation is an organization that also raises money so people can donate through those organizations. I think one of the bigger questions, at least for me, is what should a municipality be funding in terms of school services? And so, you know, as the Board of Ed is contemplating donations, I think that's a question that has to be contemplated as well. But we certainly have a mechanism to raise funds presently. Well, maybe, you know, more light shined on it and energy behind it in town. We'll figure something out. Thank you. Steve Metz, Beth, 6 Glen Hill Road. I rise in support of the budget for the reasons Paul expressed. It's not a happy support, but nevertheless, I think it's important support. I rise in support for reasons I've already expressed in letters and I won't repeat here. And it has been eloquently expressed by others in any event. What I do want to underscore is in my outstanding presentation by our Board of Education Chair with a number of compelling slides, the one that I found most compelling was the one that lists the percentage changes, both this year and in previous years, for the other schools that we consider comparable to us, the half dozen or so of them in this area. The percentage differences are stark. And Wilton is at the bottom of those lists, both this year and in past years. That is not a pattern that is designed to contribute to the health of our educational system. We rely on our schools to do what is one of the most important, if not the most important function that a town can perform. And that is to educate the next generation, prepare them to be the leaders we want them to be. You can't do that when you withhold funds from them. You can't do that when these awful choices have to be made that are reflected in the cuts that the 1.4 million represents. That's not supporting our kids. That's supporting the opposite. And that would be terribly, terribly unfortunate for a town to continue to do. 
So it is with great reluctance that I support this budget, but I do so understanding that the consequences are as Paul Burnham outlined in a very, very careful history of the courts. Thank you. Thank you. Gene Kister, 933 Ridgefield Road. Chicken Little was right. The sky is falling. <laughs> I came to Wilton in 1989. At that time, my kids were in their 40s, so I have paid for a lot of kids going through school, not one of them mine. Every year, the same kind of discussion comes along about how things are going to go to hell in a handbasket because we're not paying enough. But every year at the beginning, the presentation shows how great the schools have been doing, how many accolades, how many schools they've been to, how many merit scholarships we have. So we must be doing something right. And I think the counterplay between the Board of Finance and the Board of Education is a healthy one. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes. Please come. Maybe it doesn't sound like that much, um, it's probably only a small amount of money, but for the kids that interact with that librarian every single day, um, it's a huge, a huge loss for them. And I think um, those National Merit Scholarships and the finalists that kids are talking about, you know, my kid is one of them. And the kids, the schools have done a really good job, but it's because of all the different things that are on offer. It's because of the music department, it's because of the theatre, all the um, clubs and activities and all the things that make my child and other people's children to roll around this time. And the more we cut through budgets and through the difficult decisions that our um, superintendents have to make, the less opportunity these kids are going to have to have those lockdown experiences and to become these, these, um, these incredible adults that we all want to become. So I will be through for the budget because I don't want to sit back and stare that. So I think this is a poor record for us to support. The Board of Education, the Administration, and so I wish we were all to Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Leon uh, uh, Peter, uh, uh, who's in the process of this, uh, who's processing the uh, decision to take their son to the But uh, the first, the first we were gone. Reasons are not transparent. Um, again, if you begin to uh, make a decision, a judgment for us, I guess, uh, before giving uh, notice. And I mean, for me personally, uh, there's a question mark is why, instead of decreasing the budget, why the budget of uh, public education is not decreasing. Thank you. Tim Tangney, uh, 212 Wolf Pit Road, living right across from Miller Driscoll. I see what happens every single day at school. Um, I'm here again to support the budget. Reluctantly, hopefully, it wasn't cut down to what it is right now. But again, I also see that from talking to many people, we've said that a lot of times we see that parents aren't the majority of this town. There are a number of people that don't have kids in the system now. But, and that I've heard a lot about having us parents to step up and try to make up for whatever funds that have been 
dissolved by whatever reason to support our kids. I stand to you here as a representative of also the PTA and also a nonprofit organization in Wilton, and we've tried our best to raise funds. We've tried to do our duty as a parent in this town. But again, it will not be to the amount that has been decreased and what we have been struggling just to say, stay afloat. If we want to be competitive in this whole area, do we really just want to stay afloat? And this is something I want many of you please take away and think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, the mic is too tall to me. My name is Joan Sue Kim. So this isn't unusual, and what is un would be unusual is for the no two lows to exceed or the combined no's. But I would certainly think if that's the message you get back, how can you not take that into right. account? I think it would be extreme. And I I've been working with these people for four, this you know version of these boards for 15 years, and I'd be shocked if the Board of Finance didn't take it into consideration what the actual vote was. Okay, I mean, I think that I will be voting no too low. This is, we should listen to the professionals that put forth their budget, and um, I'm fully in support of the Board of Education. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Tom Newman, 197, Sacred Hill Road, speaking just for myself. I stood when I heard this woman speaking because I think that's the exact right point. Uh, the, the, the procedure tonight is important, it's essential for, for people to understand. It's a two-step process. Tonight the people in this room will decide to either approve to move forward the current budget request or to reduce it. 
It's just binary, those two things, approve the current or reduce it. Then we all go and vote. Forget about this room. This room just makes that first decision, a two-step process. The second step is to approve. When you go in and you when they come voting, they ballot issues, right? To approve, to say no too low or no too high. I've been so impressed by people who have spoken tonight, uh, including people who I don't agree with. I think the, the quality of the conversation has been superb tonight. But the one thing I have not understood is people who are concerned about voting no too low being afraid that the Board of Finance is going to take it out of them and is going to therefore reduce it further. I don't think they'd do that. Uh, you know, I mean, that's nutty. So it, what will happen is if those who feel that the budget is too low, if they vote in favor of the budget, I'll tell you, if it's the same exact people on the board next year, they will take tonight's or, or Saturday, you know, when we ultimately vote, they will take that result as the voice of the town. They're taking the questionnaire, I agree with the comment that the questionnaire is, you know, not strong, not scientific, but they're taking the questionnaire as the voice of the town. The real voice of the town will come in the vote. So, you know, regardless of how I'm going to vote, make up your own minds. But if you think the budget is too low, don't be afraid of voting the vote no too low. Thank you. Actually, I'll add one more step to Tom's process. Step one is what we're doing tonight. Step two is going out and voting tonight and on Saturday. And step three is if people would do something that audacious, vote them out of office. That would be something that we could all do if they vote. If we say vote the two low, and they then lower the budget out of the vengeful tact. So I, I just don't really understand that. I mean, I've had five kids um, go through the Wilton Public Schools. They've all done wonderfully, but they've done wonderfully because of the range of experiences they had, not just because of you know, one class or one counselor or those types of things. And that's why I moved to this town. I uh, love on the Board of Finance in Easton. I chose to move to Wilton because we couldn't get the school budget passed. And so um, I, I, I've lived through this, and I encourage you all to vote no. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Jim Kenyon, 44 Baltimore Road. Um, also, uh, I guess I've been in town for 20 plus years. Two boys who have gone through the school system throughout the whole life cycle for both in college right now. Um, also, I volunteered to join the Wilton Education Foundation, so if anyone wants to join or donate, um, please see me later. <laughs> I'm going to vote um, for the school budget as it is. I wish we had the original budget, but I don't want to throw things in chaos. And going back and going through this whole process again, we need to move forward. And Hopefully, the PTA, Wilton Education Foundation, and other organizations can help absorb some of this. And hopefully, going forward, the Board of Education will be able to have a stronger budget in the future. Hopefully, the Board of Finance will reevaluate everything that they have heard tonight, maybe send out another survey that is perhaps a little more comprehensive. Um, so I'm going to vote for the budget as it is. And I just want to say thank you to the Board of Education. Thank you to the Board of Selectmen. Thank you to the Board of Finance. Everybody's a volunteer. It's a tough thing to do, whichever side you, uh, you kind of view things on. So thank you for all the time you put into this. 
I spoke, but hang on before you speak. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Okay. So, yeah, so I just need to understand uh, the vote not to allow a little bit more. Because I think like other of the press, we're just new in town, and uh, since I've lived here, it's never happened. So, is it we vote no too low, we say that we want the original budget request. It goes back, and they say they approve it, and it's basically the same process all through. We come back to the town meeting, and they do the same thing again. But then we support now that it's been raised to the original level, and now we vote yes, we support. Again, um, you have your options tonight and next Saturday. If there's 15 percent and the total number of no's exceed the yeses, then it goes back for this reconsideration to the Board of Finance. They can reduce it further or they can increase it under the charter. It, it, it is correct, the gentleman before the Board of Selectmen will have no say in this Board of Ed issue at that point. And depending on Whatever happens, but from the Board of Finance, you come back to a reconvened town meeting such as this, where you can vote for what they propose, or you could reduce it, uh, but you cannot increase it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council is correct. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Seeing, seeing you any, uh, yeah, sorry, oh, can I just sorry. Uh, sorry. It's Michael Pitt from um, Pitty Springbrook Lane. I started this meeting by needing clarification about the, the high and low, low option. I guess I could distill the question more simply by asking the superintendent if we're looking to support the schools, how would we be most helpful voter? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> So we have a town charter, and that's what's in the charter, and as Paul Burnham stated, uh, he was on the charter commission. The last charter commission, I believe, was 2008, 2009. It was passed in 2009. That's what it says in the charter. It's the law. It's what we have to do. Now, we could, it would be the Board of Selectmen 
that would reconvene the charter. You open up the entire charter. It's about an 18 month process. There's a whole legal aspect to it. And we may decide to do that. Um, you know, there's been talk about it, except it's an extensive project. And you don't know what you're gonna get because you appoint these different people, and, you know. You might not recommend what you recommend, but it's something that may get done. And so, but right now, that's the rules under which we operate because that's what's in our town charter. And the charter, by the way, rec is recommended by the Charter Commission, and then it's voted on by the public. So what we had was passed by the public. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Questions, Paul? Uh, I don't see anybody else that wants to speak anyway. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Last chance. All right, hearing none. The motion that has been made and seconded, which has not been amended, is that following the annual town meeting for the appropriation of a budget for expenditures amounting to $134 million.